Good afternoon, buenas tardes. My, I want to tell you is how small the world is. Here's Eloisa Pero, who just uh, was ahead of me. He had a very good friend in Bayaonda. That same person went to Guanabacoa and became my best, my best friend, since we live right around the block from each other. And he was my best friend in Bayaonda. That's what I just... <laughs> <laughs> That's more the world is. I want to take this opportunity to recognize a person who has made a trip especially from uh, Wilmington, Delaware, to this conference. I want to introduce the Honorable Ida Wasserstein and her husband, Eric Darshaw. The Honorable is a judge in the city of Wilmington, Delaware. And, uh, and she is a federal fan. She was sent also by HIAS, the Hebrew Immigration Aid Society, to, uh, to Philadelphia, and then she stayed around the area. I just want to tell you a little bit about the Jewish experience. As I said, I uh, was, uh, grew up in Guanabacoa, and I just found out Maria Helios also from there. And it's interesting, I was living on the Calle Candelaria one time, and it was renamed Rafael de Cárdenas. Very close to two streets, one called Amargura, and the other one called the Samparado. <laughs> As a kid, first it's Colegio Lancha, Masluz, and then at the Jewish uh, school in Santos Suarez. First two were in one of our core. You know, those streets, I ride, I was walking, I would ride the bicycle every day, just another street name. But then uh, things changed. And uh, the when uh, I was remember very distinctly the change from Castro to, but from Batista to Castro. And then uh, things started getting a little bad as we went in 1959-60. Some of you may remember the name Lumumba. I made a joke in what I was in second year of high school about Lumumba. And I was taking a psychology class, and the teacher didn't appreciate what I had, the joke I had made. So happens that she was the wife of one of the uh, guys that was, I think, head of the um, Scolta of Fidel or Raul. So anyway, I was uh, always a little bit on the outspoken side. My brother was going to medical school. Then one day he comes home and says, I was told to become a miliciano, otherwise I will not be able to attend anymore. So he said, I'm not going to become a miliciano, and then therefore he had to change, look for other ways. So the opportunity arose from him to go to Israel. So he went on the first flight uh, that went from Cuba to Israel. Uh, he was he's six years older than I am. And then he started writing uh, what he had to do there in the kibbutz, and the, uh, getting up at four o'clock in the morning, and. Uh, <coughs> Worrying about all these things, that, and I started saying, "This is not for me." <laughs> <laughs> and that's my situation deteriorated. <laughs> now, with grandparents and parents who had already gone through an exodus in their lifetime, they had my grandfather, my rest in peace. He had the took the risk in 1926 to go to Cuba from what is now Belarus. People ask me, where your family from? I said, depends the year. When they, were, <laughs> they, were, they, were, they were born in White Russia. Then when they left, it was uh, with a Polish passport, and now it's Belarus. And um, seven years later, my mother and the rest of the family came to Cuba with grandmother and five other kids. And you know, we had a very nice life. My parents, my, my entire family loved Cuba. We were well taken care of by the communities, Juanabacoa was an adorable place. And um, the day came when one day I started going, every Sunday I used to meet in El Vedado, in, in the Cuban Jewish community. And we started seeing every Sunday somebody else was leaving. And I said, what's going on here? Until two cousins of mine says, we're leaving in two weeks. I said, where are you going? We're going, we live in Cuba. I said, how are you leaving? You don't, you don't have a passport, you don't have a visa, do this, that. They don't, I wouldn't know, we're just going. So I came home, told my parents, and uh, he said, then we called the, my aunt, senior aunt, she doesn't know anything about it. 
I say, I'll come out, this is nonsense. So fortunately, the parents, the father of the kid, the girls, was my godfather. So I went to him and I said, tell me what's going on here. How are they going? So finally, he told me what was going on. And he says, you want to leave? I said, yes, because otherwise I'm going to get into trouble here. And he took me to a place in downtown Havana, La Habana Vieja, to an individual by the name of Mauricio Halevis, who was the contact with the Jewish uh, highest Hebrew Immigration Aid Society, which was an organization which is now celebrating 130 years old. They have helped to resettle Jews throughout the world. And he had a store, and at noon when they closed, he would take care of these kids, take the applications, and then send them to New York. And then a few weeks later, he came and he brought me this visa waiver. And here was, I was supposed to leave just before the uh, Bay of Pigs, but uh, because of the Bay of Pigs situation, the airport closed for several days. So I did not get to leave until May 10th. And uh, I spent Bay of Pigs in Miramar, even though I was in one hour because my uncles were there, watching how the people were being brought in into the Blanquita uh, Auditorium. Anybody that weekend that looked happy, especially in Buena Vista, right next to the Columbia, I watched how they were being picked up on a bus and brought over to, uh, to this Blanquita. In any case, I left May 10th. I went to, I thought I was going to be in Miami like some of my friends. I get down. We also had a George. Uh, he's he's still, uh, still alive, he's in the 80s. Uh, and uh, he, uh, his name is Alberto Baru. And when I come down from the stairs, he says, here's your tickets. You're going to Los Angeles today at 7 o'clock. I only had an aunt with two kids here. We didn't know was, she knew it was coming, but not when. I want to surprise her. Called her immediately ran, nothing to be done. At seven o'clock, I said, remember, get on an airplane. It's interesting, now that we talk about coach sharing and sharing, I remember very distinctly, it was an American Airlines jet, one of the newer Boeing 707. First leg was Miami to New Orleans. It said they're national airlines, remember that? The second leg was from New Orleans to Dallas, Fort Worth. It said Delta, and then the last leg, Fourth Worth to Los Angeles was American Airlines. Anyway, I was there, went to, I was putting foster homes, people never know my life. Call home, I don't, those remember very distinctly, a call from Havana to, to the United States was at the time $12.50 for the th first three minutes. Anybody remember that? And I was basically going to school. I was able to adopt relatively fast. I was treated well. And uh, I was shifted to another foster home within a few months. And uh, there in the San Fernando Valley area of Los Angeles, uh, city of Nice, I meet two brothers who are right in the, in the same class. These two brothers who had come from Cuba, their uncle had brought them over, was an individual by the name of Candido Hernandez, may he rest in peace, who was the uncle. He brought him from Cienfuegos Cienfu through Spain to, to Los Angeles to live with them, we became friendly. And I had to walk about six blocks every, uh, from the school to the bus stop. And as you know, Los Angeles doesn't rain much, but when it rains, it can rain for days. So I had, you know, we became friendly. Every morning he would come in, say hello to all of us, and come and pick him up. I would go then, one day I had to ask him, could you please take me to the bus stop? And he said, of course. So he did that a couple, three, four times. Then he realized, that I was somewhat desamparado. And he said, you know what? He was Catholic. He says, I'm not Jewish, but I'm going to go to the administration of this Jewish place you're at, Vista del Mar. Vista del Mar. Nombre español, pero it was originally a Jewish orphanage, founded in 1908. They were the responsible for me. And he says, I'm going to ask for them to allow you to come spend time with us on weekends because tú necesitas un ambiente criollo los fines de semana. And he did that. Now, this man traveled, okay? Never met him in my life except through the two, the equivalent distance from Dayland to Aventura, 29 miles, four trips to come and pick me up, trick it to his house, back and forth. Did that for about seven or eight months. And he said to me one of those trips, Marcus, you need to learn Hebrew. 
Hebrew. Cándido, tú estás loco. <laughs> I have enough problems learning English. What do I need Hebrew for? <laughs> He said, Marcus, you're Jewish. You should always be proud of your background. The Jews have, the, have given a lot to the world. The only way you're going to learn the culture, the history, everything about the Jewish people is through the language. He's giving me an advice that I went in one year, went out the other. Not realizing that 17 years later, I was going to be the head of an Israeli bank in Miami. <laughs> Isn't that something where some people give you advice a lot of time and we don't listen to it? In any case, finally my uncles started arriving and I came. They, they claimed me. Every time that I would ask to be to be sent to Miami because some of my friends were here. I don't know why it was, I was selected to go to LA. Still a rest mystery. But it's interesting that this place I was under the supervision, I was called Vista del Mar, as I said. Their logo to this day, it is two kids holding an umbrella. And from time to time you would see the actual letterhead when it was in, in, in color, they would have the umbrella in red. Look at years later, we have a book on our operation, The Red Umbrella. So I came, to, uh, came back to Miami, my, my brother came back, he went to Atlanta with a friend, and my parents arrived just before the missile crisis. And I was, then we decided all to resettle in Atlanta where I finished high school and I went to Georgia State University, got my accounting degree because that was the only thing that I was doing well in. Because I was in Miami several, several months with my uncle until my parents arrived, I was well treated, I was eating well in Los Angeles. One day I asked my uncle at the dinner table, you know, I'd like to have a steak. He said, a steak? You see, we're having breakfast three days old. If you want a steak, go to work. So, so I went downtown Miami and I started walking out. There was a restaurant called Black Angle Steakhouse and I asked for a job and they gave me a job. <laughs> And I was the salad, mar the salad man having two, um, two steaks a day. <laughs> But there was one problem, you see, everything's got a catch. The catch was that now I was going to Miami Beach High for several weeks. And I was going to class from 7.30 to about 2.30, started working at 4 until 11 o'clock at night. And then on Saturdays and Sundays I had a split shift. I had to go for lunch, then wait two hours, and then go back until at 5 for dinner until 11. The end result was I was a senior, and I said, if I don't get out of here, I'm going to flunk, because the only two things I was doing well in was, like, was bookkeeping, and it was physette, <laughs> even though it was not very. So I called my brother and said, guess what? You're going, to, you're going to have another roommate. And I went there. Unfortunately, I got help. We found another type of job, and I was able to finish my senior year and then get to Georgia State. Where that's, how, that's how the whole idea comes to come into accounting. And uh, I have had a, a two very excellent professions in my life, one of being a banker, and I got some of my colleagues here, including Sepero, who I also met when he was uh, in the banking industry. We got a couple of others here in the back. And uh, also, I've always enjoyed teaching. And while in Atlanta, I started teaching at the Temple of Sunday School. And I've had a, already a career in teaching since the early 70s, and I've been at FIU since 1980, and I love it. So uh, I just want to tell you that As we look at this, and I look back at one of our poor, even my parents have said, you know, they didn't want to go back until changes took place. And there's one thing I remember. My parents started, they had a very small store, uh, clothing store, which they just built, finished building in 1957. And my mother started to work construction, and they had to redo the sidewalk, said, we're going to inscribe the name of the store on the sidewalk in granite. The name of the store was La Sin Rival. And I'll tell you, the Pedro Pants have no rivals. We are unique, and it basically follows the experience that we have as the Pedro Pants. The Jewish kids, some of those 10,000 originally from Kinder Transport, were lucky. I think we have been luckier because some of those kids who went to England didn't make it either. So I think that we, we used to be proud 
that we have a community with Sing Sing Rivani. Thank you very much.